All right, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> All right, so uh, later in the presentation, I'm gonna get to some uh, live coding, and this is the first time that I'll have ever done that in a presentation, so wish me luck. Um, so first, I wanted to talk a little bit about myself. Um, I've been uh, coding for a really long time. I, I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. And uh, obviously I'm a Jamstack enthusiast and then you can put this meet up. Uh, I am CEO and founder of SubscribePro. So SubscribePro is a subscription commerce uh, SaaS product. We work for brands that sell their um, products on the web. And I'm also the creator of a startup called Pylon. And Pylon is an experimental uh, API driven e-commerce platform. And so one question I get a lot when I travel is about Baltimore. Um, typically it starts with, oh yeah, I've seen The Wire. I know what Baltimore is like. Uh, sometimes if I'm lucky, I'll get a John Waters reference. But uh, you can see here uh, one of our fine bumper stickers, Baltimore, there's more than murder here. And it's true. We have many great things. <laughs> we have many great things in town. Um, uh, similar to Boston, we have a ton of history. Um, we've been around for a really long time. Uh, we have an amazing uh, cathedral that was one of the first built in the Americas. It was designed by uh, Latrobe, same architect as the US Capitol. Uh, the War of 1812, the Battle of Baltimore, obviously was fought in Baltimore. And that's where the Star Spangled Banner was written. Um, so many cool things a really uh, blossoming art and music scene as well. And so like I said, I've been writing code for a really long time. Uh, I started in the mid 80s on a machine that looked uh, very much like this. And you could get cartridges for this machine that had like the games of the time, like the Space Invaders and the other Atari games. And I did that, uh, but I wanted to play more games. And so I got the, you can see here, the extended basic cartridge. So I got that one and I started writing my own games. At first I was typing them in from a book and I had a cassette recorder that would plug into this thing to save my files. My parents didn't spring for the disk drive for some reason. And so it would only, uh, it would only work about one out of two times. And so I got really good at typing in the, the programs from the book that I had. And eventually I started writing my own uh, programs and I've been coding ever since. And then I just wanted to tell you briefly about what SubscribePro does. So basically we power uh, this feature that you see right here. Uh, this is a client of ours and we facilitate the monthly delivery of physical products. And it's a pretty simple thing when you see it as the consumer, uh, but there's a whole mess of stuff that happens behind the scenes to make that happen. So we send emails and we schedule orders, we optimize expired credit cards, and we provide customer service tools and everything else. Uh, so I wanted to talk tonight about uh, static and dynamic data in a Jamstack context. And this could apply in Hugo or it could apply to the Gatsby static site generator that I'm gonna talk about later. Uh, so we're going to talk about static sites, Jamstack sites, static and dynamic data. And so what is a Jamstack site really? And I saw that Jim uh, uses this definition as well. <laughs> um, but I think the key here, obviously the Jam, JavaScript, APIs, and markup. But I think the other key is this last phrase where it says served without web servers. And... Um, of course, they don't mean really without web servers, but they mean from a very dumb CDN, right? It still has to come from somewhere. Um, and so what is a static site generator? Uh, well, staticgen.com says basically the same thing that Jamstack tells us. This means there's no moving parts in the deployed web server. So again, basically dumb web servers. I think that's the, that's the common element of static sites, Jamstack sites. And uh, I think a lot of front end um, development is moving in that direction, whether it knows it or not. Um, the essence is no web servers. And so 
the thing with, with these static uh, sites is that out of the box, you mostly get static data. So typically the data is pulled in at build time when the site's built, and then it's pushed out to the CDN along with the code and the other parts of the site. And so that's a problem if you have data that's not naturally static. And so, you know, data changes. Some data is static, like my name is probably never going to change, maybe once in a lifetime. Um, but on the other end of the spectrum, you have, say, stock quotes, which might change thousands of times a second, right? So there's this whole continuum of um, does this data change frequently or does it hardly ever change? And so if it hardly ever changes, static site generator is going to do what you need out of the box. Uh, if it changes frequently, then we need to do something else. So what do we do with our, with our stale static data? Um, so we can use the JavaScript and the APIs from Jamstack uh, to help us with this problem. And uh, we can use the JavaScript to fresh new data in the page, right? So even in the context of a Hugo site, like we were just looking at, we could put JavaScript into that template and that JavaScript could go out to an API and bring in uh, new data into that page. And so um, if we wanted to get really advanced, we could even say open a WebSocket connection right from the browser and we could get uh, new data pushed in in real time. And that's probably what you would do with, uh, say you have a stock market ticker. Um, you're probably gonna need something like that, that WebSocket connection. And the, the fresh data is much tastier. Um, Okay, so I'm going to take you through an example, and I'm going to use the Gatsby JS um, static site generator. And uh, we're going to use, like I said, JavaScript to pull in the uh, dynamic data. Um, I work in e-commerce a lot, and so that's what I know. And so I decided to do a product details page. Uh, just to make sure everybody knows what a product details page is. So this is a specific term in the e-commerce world, but it's basically the page that's about one product that typically has an image in the upper left, a product title, and then a buy button, maybe some other options and, and other information, and then more content as you scroll down the page. Um, it's a pretty typical uh, standardized type of a layout. And so we're gonna build a product details page with Gatsby JS, and then we're gonna bring in some dynamic data onto that page. And since Gatsby is built with React, we have all the power of um, JavaScript, and we're gonna use the Apollo uh, GraphQL client, um, which also has a, a React library that fits nicely together. Uh, a really cool thing is that this is gonna let us use kind of similar GraphQL queries to pull in the data on the static side, and then again on the on the dynamic side. Um, I should say this, this of course works because we're talking to a GraphQL API. Um, you could do similar things if you have a REST API though. And so I'll say there's one, one key to making this work really well in Gatsby and that's kind of where we put the, um, something called the Apollo provider. And we're gonna put that in a place so that it's, um, it's kind of done once and there's going to be caches and, and things like that. And we can switch pages in the site and still keep our same Apollo provider. And so uh, that's credit to Jason Langstorff from Gatsby um, who provided this example of how to do that. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive in and go through this example here. So bear with me while we switch things up. And so by the way, I have the finished product published on GitHub and I'll, I'll send that link uh, after the meetup. 
Um, but basically, I'm going to start with a new Gatsby project. So we're going to go to the command line. And I've already installed the Gatsby tool. Uh, so let's call it uh, Jamstack Boston PDP. Sure. Uh, Good, a little bigger. <laughs> All right, so we have a new shiny Gatsby project. And I'm just gonna start that up and look at it in a browser so we can follow along as we make changes. There we go. And there we go. All right. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to pull in some product data uh, to put on our page. So We're going to use the Pylon source plugin here. And so I'm just going to add that with Yarn. And while that loads, I'm just going to put the configuration that we're going to need. How many, how many people here have used Gatsby in the past? Anybody? One? One-ish? How many people plan to use Gatsby? <laughs> it's definitely um, it's definitely a very powerful tool. Um, I've taken to using it even as a replacement for Create React app in some cases, uh, even when I didn't need the kind of static site generation. Um, so I'll go ahead and paste in the. Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna open the project uh, in VS Code. And I will paste in the configuration for that source plugin. So a source plugin in Gatsby uh, basically is just a way to pull data into uh, Gatsby's kind of internal data layer. And so we'll put that in. And then we're going to take this query. And this is a GraphQL query that's going to pull in uh, products from a catalog over on the pylon side. And it's going to pull in images as well as like ID, SKU, name, uh, the price, et cetera. And so we're just going to put that right in our main index page. And this is going to be what, um, what Gatsby would call a page query. So we, we paste this query down here and export it as query. And then we can uh, bring that in as this data variable. And so I'm going to go ahead and display those products. I have some HTML already written here that's going to do that. And we're just going to replace that big uh, Gatsby image. So let's do that. And then one more piece here. I think we need some imports. And we're not using that one anymore. And so I think if we restart our development server, So interestingly enough, um, 
Gatsby is a, like I said, a static site generator. So it's running the build process now. And so you're actually gonna see it pulling the image files down from that GraphQL API. And uh, Gatsby has a, a data layer built into it. And one of the things it can do is transform images. So it's actually pulling those image files down from the API and then it's transforming them locally. And then it's gonna be pushing, assuming this was a production build, it would be pushing those back out as part of the built site. Um, so it's a very powerful feature. Uh, it's not necessarily the best feature for use at scale on account of that image processing can take quite a while to happen. Um, so let's go ahead and refresh that. And so there we go. We have a bunch of product data on the page and I have a little bit of CSS to make that look a little bit better. So let me put that in there as well. Actually, we're gonna to need to install styled components. It's definitely the, um, in the React world. Is anybody doing React development? Okay, so you know styled components. <laughs> There's a lot of argument whether it's, you know, the best way or, or I think it depends on the situation, like most technologies. Uh, and then we're gonna add the Gatsby styled components uh, plugin and we're gonna add the configuration for that too. And then uh, we will restart the development server. And while that starts up, we're gonna go ahead and add the CSS. So we put that right in the template. Um, the reason, uh, well, one of the strengths of style components is that you can write the CSS right in uh, your JavaScript JSX files. And so basically what I'm doing here is I'm saying, uh, give me a div and make it styled with the following CSS and then call that uh, a component called wrapper. And then I'm gonna come down here and put the wrapper. Around my other stuff and format that up. And we're going to need some imports for that as well. So let's see. Uh, all right. I think that's just going to be import styled from styled components. All right, let's see if that worked. Hey, there we go. Gatsby, by the way, is, uh, has built-in support for uh, Webpack's hot reload. So you'll notice when I switched over the page, it was already kind of reloaded with the new styling. All right, so the next thing we need is we need a details page for uh, each individual product. And so I will do that. Uh, next, and so basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a templates folder here. And I'm going to create a file, I'll call it product details. And that is going to... Uh, this whole file. And then what we're going to need to do is we're going to tell Gatsby uh, to source 
the pages. So there's a file called Gatsby node. And uh, we're going to run this uh, create pages API. And so this, this is going to do like a GraphQL query, get a list of all the products, and then it's going to create a page for, for each one of those. And each one of those pages will end up using that template that we just created. And because the node sourcing happens at build time, we're going to need to restart our development server. And we should see that load up. Correct, yeah. Sorry, I breezed, uh, I breezed past that a little bit. Um, over in the Gatsby config, um, I put in this environment key. Uh, and that is, um, that's the environment with that sample data that you're seeing. And so normally you, you might put this in an environment variable. Um, I hard coded it in the configuration here. Um, and so let's see if that worked. So our server still runs. Yay, and we have individual pages. And so uh, the next thing that we're going to do is uh, add some styling uh, real quick. And we will do that to the then format that up and we will put that around the product content. Sorry about that. Um, let's see. <laughs> uh, okay, who knows how to make this uh, bigger? <laughs> All right, it's obvious. <laughs> there we go. How's that? I'm going to make that a little smaller. And so, yeah, so I've got the, uh, you know, based on the styled components pattern, I've got the CSS right here in the same file. And I've got my uh, template. Here in this file, this would be the template. Uh, I've also got the GraphQL query that we're using to pull in the static data on this page, uh, kind of all in this file. And um, so, um, you know, it's a nice uh, for small components. It's a nice pattern to have all that together and co-located uh, in the one file. Um, so let's see what that looks like. And so yeah, so we've got a nice uh, product details page, if uh, simplistic. Uh, so here's the thing, we pulled in the price and uh, prices can change. And uh, you know, another common thing that changes in e-commerce, of course, is inventory. Maybe the product goes in stock, out of stock, uh, maybe there's two available, maybe there's 10 available. Uh, that's not something that we, you know, we don't want somebody to be purchasing the product at the wrong price or when it's really out of stock, right? So we want that to be pretty, pretty dynamic. Um, so let's go ahead and pull in the price dynamically. I guess actually first, let me show you that that price is kind of fixed at build time. So if I do,
And so this is going to be the back end where I can, can edit that product. Um, so let's say that uh, we have tons of lipstick to sell and we're going to go $12. And so great, I've updated that. If we were to pull that from the API again, we would get the $12 um, price, but my site content is still uh, stuck at $24. And so we can see if I were to stop the, uh, the server and run another build, it of course will hit those APIs again and then it'll pick up the new, uh, the new price. Let's just wait for that to run. Um, uh, but we want to make that dynamic. And so one way we can do that is we could use, because this is a GraphQL API, uh, we could use the Apollo client and particularly the React Apollo um, library to pull that stuff in. And we can take advantage of some of the GraphQL that we already have. So let's go ahead and First thing we're going to need to do is is be is to add Apollo to the project, and so I'm going to grab that. And then we're going to create uh, we're going to create this client file. And this is gonna basically set up our Apollo client. And so we'll just put that in a folder called Apollo. And so this is a little bit uh, lengthy, um, the code here, but basically it needs to go out and uh, it uses that same Again, I've hard-coded that environment ID. So it uses that same environment ID. It has to go out and get a, a token, which it can then use to call the GraphQL API. And then down here, um, what we're doing is we're just passing an authorization header into Apollo. So every time Apollo makes those API calls, it's gonna insert uh, that authorization header. And then we're also pulling in Apollo's in-memory cache so Apollo has a lot of features that would be uh, similar to something like Redux in the sense that it, it can store data centrally. And of course it can store and cache the data that you're getting from GraphQL APIs. They even give you the ability to kind of push your own data in there and mix it in with the other data and, and pull it back out with um, GraphQL queries. So uh, once we do that, we need to then do kind of the magic step to make Apollo play well with um, Gatsby. And so what we're going to do is we're actually going to take this Apollo provider component. Should I make this bigger as well? Um, we're going to take this Apollo provider component and, oops. Uh, this component here. And we're going to wrap the entire application in that component so that even when we change, even when we change pages, that component is going to stay in existence and our cache is going gonna, is gonna to persist across pages and things like that. So I'm going to get that guy and uh, uh, we're going to put that in uh, two different special files that Gatsby has. Um, so Gatsby offers a file called Gatsby Browser. And so this is really um, code that kind of runs uh, in a way before the framework takes over in the browser specifically. And then there's another file called Gatsby SSR and um, SSR for server-side rendering. So this is a similar file in the sense that the JavaScript in this file runs before the framework takes over at build time when Gatsby is generating the, the pages. 
And so you could have situations where you might want to have something different at build time versus what's running in the browser. But we're going to put this in both places. And let's see if I do that. Uh, so I should be able to restart the development server. And while that is restarting, uh, I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna find my product details template. And I'm gonna put a few things in there. Maybe that wasn't the best way to do it. And so this is gonna be my GraphQL query that I use in Apollo. And so right now I'm just getting the primary price but there's definitely potential to where we could write um, one query that we're using down here and we could we could use part of that same query up here for the for the day. so we've got the static data down here at the bottom in the gatsby page query and then uh, up here at the top we've got this uh, dynamic data coming in through the through the apollo query and so then i'm going to take this markup and I'm going to replace the price display. And we'll format that up. And so this is the React Apollo um, library. And this component, the query component, it's going to basically take that GraphQL query that we have above. It's going to insert uh, some variables. So in this case, the product ID. So we get just the, the one product. And then it's going to give us back uh, data, loading, and error. And then we're basically going to say, um, let's start and say the current price. This is coming from the static product data. And we're going to say if it's not loading and it's not an error, uh, let's go ahead and set that to the dynamic version of the price. And then let's go ahead and render that in a, in a span and format the, the thing as currency. Um, so let's see how that does. It compiled. So uh, let's see how that does. So it looks like that's working. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and try to update the price. And let's say we're going back up to $18. Uh, we sold a bunch at 12 and uh, we're going to go back. And there we go. It worked. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you can see uh, it loads at $12 first and then it uh, switches to 18. So um, that, um, when I do a page refresh, you know, the cache is only, you know, in memory. So it's, you know, it, it might be cached. We could probably do better with that, I guess is what I'm saying. But um, any, uh, any questions to this point? I know I, I went quickly through a lot of kind of Gatsby stuff and uh, yeah, go ahead. I guess I'm curious about the add to bag button, which sort of implies a database or something, or at least some kind of persistence. So, so where do you go from here in terms of, this is all read only so far, mm -hmm. but what about rights? Well, that's a, really good, uh, that's a really good question. And so one of the features of the Pylon platform is actually a cart API or a bag API. Uh, and so you could, you could do that whole aspect um, via Apollo if you chose, and you could kind of maintain the, the cart and add items, delete items, et cetera. Um, you could, something that um, some people have done in e-commerce is also maintain the cart locally. So like just in the, in the browser um, cache, maybe in local storage uh, even. And then uh, at the time that an order is placed, then the whole cart is sent to the server side. Um, that can work really well in a very simple scenario, 
um, when you get into a lot of things that you see in e-commerce, that's not necessarily practical because like I said, the price of the items can change in real time. An item could go out of stock in real time. Um, in order to calculate uh, things like discounts and uh, tax and all these other things requires a ton of kind of server connections to third party services and then also business logic that the, that the brand or the retailer provides. And so it's, it can quickly get unwieldy to try to do all of that on the client side. And so, uh, so that's why, you know, I think the kind of the cart API um, method of doing things is the way to go. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah thanks. <laughs> I have a question. Um, so you, you kind of have this idea of like, I think you're getting at kind of like the central thesis of the talk is like this dynamic static data. So it's like, do we, do we build this pricing information and other information in at the build time or do we do it? Can I pull it live from the API and, and, and have you seen, or do you recommend kind of like um, these two things to happen in tandem? Like, so for instance, if you need the price to be updated quickly, you pull that in through an API and then, like build it in the background so that price gets in so you don't see that little toggle between 12 and 18 like forever or, or how do you recommend like approaching something like that yeah i mean so i think we could we could fix that little toggle of the, the 12 and 18 um without doing that but yeah i i think generally you're going to end up with a some sort of regular build process and maybe that's daily and maybe it's triggered by events um, but it's it's going to be a regular um kind of build process Probably that's as your your number of pages on the site grows and so forth. That's not going to be practical to have that build process trigger on kind of every single product update in a large catalog, right? And I I know that um, Gatsby, for instance, is working on you know technologies to make that situation better. Um, and I know that with something like a Hugo, you know, you can build many many more pages um, more quickly at build time. But I think ultimately you're still going to run into that problem. I mean, if we think of the the stock market uh, price quote example, right? Those prices change thousands of times a second, right? You can't rebuild the entire website thousands of times a second and and push it out to a CDN. Um, so I think it's, there's there's always going to be a place for a mixture of the static and the dynamic data. I mean, in even if we think of that stock market example, right? There's no reason to you know, to update the entire page in real time, right? You just need to update that price field. And so I, th I think a mix of the two is ultimately what's gonna be called for in most situations. Hopefully that makes Other sense. Other questions? If, um, I don't know if we have enough time or if anybody's interested, but we could also do the uh, React Hooks version of the Apollo library. Yeah. Anybody? Okay. Um, so this is in beta. Uh, it's something that um, a few months ago when I was doing a lot of work with Apollo, I wished had been around then because I love React Hooks and it makes... Uh, I mean, if you, if you look at this query section here, right, um, this is a pretty simple thing, right? It's just one price that we're updating and it, it gets pretty ugly here. Uh, it can be kind of hard to follow the mix of the, of the JavaScript and the markup. And um, so if we switch to the hooks version, we can move the, the JavaScript logic kind of up here above at the beginning of the component. And then we can just kind of have the, the markup down here that's going to make things a lot cleaner um, for something like this. Um, so I will go ahead and pull uh, that. First thing we're going to need to do is add a package for um, React hooks. And like I said, that's still in beta. Let's see, we're going to need to we need to change to the hooks version of the provider. And 
So we'll go back to the Gatsby browser and Gatsby SSR files. And you'll just see that's coming from the new, uh, new package instead of the old one. It's more or less uh, compatible, backward compatible. And then I'll go ahead and get the development server started again and put this code into the page. Take out query and we'll put in the use query hook. And we can come back down here to the component. And the first thing we're going to do is, so this is already a function based component in React terms. Um, I'm just going to put the curly brace uh, syntax around it. And I'll just format that up. And then that's going to give us some space at the beginning of the component to uh, put, um, put this logic. So basically what we're doing here is we're going to use that same Apollo query that we already had. And we're going to use the use query hook and uh, much like the, uh, the query component, it's going to give us back loading error and data. And so then we just moved our, our logic here to kind of build this current price. And so when we get down here into the markup, uh, this is the part where we get a lot of benefit out of using the hooks version because we can just get back to what looks a lot more like a template. And let's see, that looks right. Let's see what we get here. All right, sure enough. And let me just change that price again. Maybe, maybe not. Hmm. Oh. I just added this today. <laughs> I think we need to get the right, uh, the right variable going in there. Let's see. Oh, so we got to get the, um, the variables in there somehow. I want to say, I'll just quickly uh, <laughs> see if that's it. Sorry, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> uh, let's see. There we go, very, I don't know, that's the old way. All right, it looks like that. All right, so that, variables, and there are one more. And it looks like variables needs to be what?
There we go. So that's the hooks version. <laughs> All right, any other questions? All right, well, thank you for indulging me on my first uh, live coding experience. <laughs>